as myself, I'll start by thanking all three witnesses. Uh, I.G. Horowitz, I'm going to probably direct my questions to you, in part because of what you do now and in part because of what you used to do in a very distinguished career as, a, as an assistant United States attorney. Give us the other side of the argument on compulsory process. Um, because when something, it, it sounds like a great idea, and this does, the ability to compel right. uh, evidence, really, mm -hmm. the fact that we don't have it leads me to believe that there is at least some argument on the other side. What would it be? So the Justice Department itself has opposed giving IGs. That would be an argument. Uh, and their concern is, Ben, that um, if we subpoena somebody and compel them to speak to us, that could negatively impact their ability to pursue criminal cases in matters they may have ongoing that we don't know about. We put in place a procedure in the act to address that. The department would get notice before we gave any, issued any subpoenas. Much like is currently in existence, as you know, from being an AUSA yourself, um, that before anybody gives immunity to anybody in the Justice Department, there's a central process for doing that to make sure an AUSA in New York doesn't harm a case going on by an AUSA in South Carolina, for example. That's what we've proposed here. And frankly, I, as a former prosecutor, don't understand that argument. If I was the AUSA handling that case that was criminal and they didn't know about our work, I'd want to know about our work because that could give them additional leverage in their criminal case. So as a former prosecutor, frankly, I, I don't understand the argument once you put in place the protections, and Mr. Roth also is a former prosecutor, and we we very much respect the concern, and we'll work with them to put that in place. But there's a there's a way to address that, I think. Well, I hope so. I, I think there has to be um, the ability to simply leave your place of employment and avoid scrutiny or having to provide information. Um, makes it really tough to conduct fulsome investigations. Um, keep that same old hat on for a second. Okay. Um, there's an issue with respect to OPR. Mm -hmm. um, explain for those who may not have worked for the Department of Justice, don't explain, don't understand what OPR is. What is the issue there and what are both sides of the argument? Okay. So the office OPR, the Office of Professional Responsibility at the Justice Department was created um, long before the IG Act was passed to look at misconduct by prosecutors. The head of that office is appointed by the department's leadership, the deputy AG and the attorney general, um, and they handle all allegations of uh, uh, prosecutorial misconduct against prosecutors um, for conduct in connection with their jobs as lawyers. So for example, in the courtroom and those kinds of issues. That's a carve out that exists now in the IG Act, so that when my office was created back in 1988, it was carved out of our jurisdiction. We're the only IG with this carve out. And it means that while we look at misconduct by FBI agents, DEA agents, ATF agents, other personnel, non-lawyers in the department, as well as lawyers when they engage in misconduct outside of work, we can't look at prosecutorial allegations of prosecutorial misconduct. Um, we don't see a principled reason why we should be able to look at FBI agents' misconduct, but not misconduct by federal prosecutors. If, there's, if it's important enough to have independent oversight by a statutorily independent IG over FBI agents, surely it's the same for prosecutors who wield at least as much power as FBI agents by their ability to act improperly in a courtroom. The, the flip of that has been, the department's argument has been, and again, they've always opposed giving that authority to us is the, that the Office of Professional Responsibility has managed that function effectively since its creation. They know how to do those cases, and there's no reason to change the process. Um, it's my view that for purposes of independent oversight and transparency, um, there have been many issues coming forward in the last many years about questions of oversight of prosecutors, um, several judges have raised concerns, um, and I think um, it is, um, it, people would be hard pressed to explain to an FBI agent why they need independent oversight by an uh, inspector general, but that the prosecutors they're working with day in, day out, they go to another, through another door. Particularly in many instances, the bureau agent herself or himself may also be an attorney. 
So their, their agent conduct is scrutinized or investigated one way. And if I heard you correctly, Representative Heiss, uh, Cedric Richmond from Louisiana um, have worked with you on, um, on proposing a legislative remedy in this area as well as the one Stevie made reference to. That's correct. All right. And we have uh, legis we've worked as well with bipartisan members on the Senate side to do the same. Last issue, because uh, I'm out of time, I don't like to do it, but uh, quickly, I'm not asking you about the merits of it. You couldn't talk about it. Don't, wouldn't ask you about it, but your rep uh, reputation for integrity um, is well deserved and um, has been around for a long time. You are looking into certain matters and decisions made by the Department of Justice uh, in the 2016 um, mm -hmm. election cycle, yeah. calendar year. Do you have uh, an update from a time standpoint? And secondarily, are you able to access all the witnesses and documents that you think are necessary for you to conduct a fulsome investigation? Um, and I can certainly talk to the, the process questions and the timing questions, and I appreciate your respecting the ability to com complete that um, in an independent way. Um, in terms of process, we have gotten all the records we've asked for. Um, we've gotten them as a general matter in a timely fashion. We've interviewed dozens of people. We're not, we're not at the 100 level yet, but we're, we're in the dozens range. We've reviewed about 1.2 million records um, in the course of the investigation, so uh, pretty substantial effort by the team, which has done great work. Um, we are aiming to release the report um, in late winter, early spring, so hopefully in that March, April time period. Obviously, I can't commit to that because as we've seen, Events can arise, issues can arise that requires to do additional uh, interviews or get additional records. And given there's a classified piece to this, as you know, it requires a significant process to make sure that individuals who are no longer at the department or lawyers for individuals who are no longer at the department can actually be part of those interviews uh, by getting renewed clearances. So that's impacted somewhat the time frame, but we're moving along quite expeditiously, and that's my hope. Thank you. Uh, I thought I was last, but the gentleman from Wisconsin has joined us. Um, and I apologize. I'm, I'm General Lee from Michigan. I didn't see you.